On this episode of Straight Outta Gabriola, I'm with Tammy Hudgen, Gabriola artist and now author and teacher for others. She talks with me about what she's learned about creativity and how she got out of the box of what she thought her life would be. I was so in the box of how I was seen by my family and who I thought, like, my dreams were not big. They weren't big. Yeah. And there, was, <laughs> there was a time where I was like, well, if I could get a job in a bank, man, I'd be so respectable, like I could be a teller. And that's a great, that's a great job. I'm not saying anything about that job. It's just like, but that was the, that was the maximum height of what I thought of. And, and just have a little house that I'm making payments on. On this Isle of the Arts, there's quite a gang of painters, sculptors, weavers, all manner of creators. And there are some that, well, you, you see their work and, and you know there's something there that just goes beyond a greater depth and vision infused with a fire that's not just anyone can grab hold of and work with. I can think of Gabriola artists like the Sheila Norgates, Carolyn Bells, Elsa Bluthners, Terrell Clarks, Minnie Josephs, Jeff Malloy's, you know, more, even more. And, and, and I certainly don't mean to be exclusive here. Don't get me wrong at all. Um, there are so many talented, creative people from Gabriola. I'm simply trying to set up a bit of a framework for you in thinking about Tammy Hudgen in particular. Not only for her art, which is collected by fans the world over, but for her story. One of beautiful humility, of gratitude, and of a person who has worked hard for over two decades to make a career, a living, as an artist. Not as a second career or a hobby or a retirement project, and not that there's anything wrong with that either. She's largely self-taught, learning as she went along. It's a beautiful story. And it's a personal story that many, I think, could probably relate finding out who you really are and how to live that life. And as Tammy refers to herself and her journey, it's an expressive life almost missed. Yeah, grade four was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then after that, it was school was pretty downhill until I actually quit school and near the end of grade ten, and yeah. I just left it all and left the town where I was growing up and everything, and just headed out on my own, thinking that I had a bunch of answers that I didn't have. From my early teens to my mid twenties of living like super reckless, crazy, <laughs> wild life, where I was just like every kind of substance and any yeah. kind of like risky stuff yeah. so to me it was like okay i'm gonna get respectable now I can, for some <laughs> reason in my mid-20s it was like <laughs> just the conditions around me led me to that feeling and to me that was what respectable meant it was like kind of conventional stable predictable but yet, obviously, there was a part of me that was not happy. Like, I mean, I saw at that time, I was when I was around 18, I went into the glass shop. I talk about this yeah. in my book. Or I went into this stained glass studio with my grandma, who was getting this thing repaired. And I was just, I was mesmerized by it. And it never even, not even occurred to me that that would be something I could ever do. Yeah. I had so little confidence in myself in myself in general, let alone doing something creative. Yeah. There was, that was just not, it was not even on the radar. It was not on the radar. All of us can pinpoint some moments in our lives where there's something that happens or someone you're exposed to and it strikes a chord. And that's where I started my conversation with Tammy in her studio. I moved to the coast from a small prairie town I was very conservative, little town, and I, uh, I didn't have, like, there wasn't a lot of examples of, or that I could see any way of kind of alternative, different ways of living, let alone really creative and artistic, like just even just different ways. Yeah. So when I first moved to the coast, I, 
I had a job before I moved out here. Right. And um, I was working in a pharmacy then, mm -hmm. and I was sent to this training course for how to fit knee braces and things like that. And I met a woman there who was from Vancouver Island. And I said, is there jobs out there for pharmacy technicians? Because that's what I was working as at the time. She said, yeah, I'll check it where I, at the store where I work. And, <laughs> and then I got a call like a week later offering me a job. My partner and I at the time, we were ready to do something different. And he was already like speculating about Vancouver Island. So then I got the job and I moved out here. And the man that I worked for, he's still a very good friend. Mm -hmm. We just had this deep connection instantly like we'd known each other other lifetimes and he was a pharmacist he he's a gay man he's a ballet dancer an art collector I guy he just exposed me to so many things that I I just had never been exposed to before right, yeah. and so that's what led me like started opening my mind to the possibilities of a different kind of life, even beyond moving away from the prairie town and living on the coast, but mm -hmm. like how much more it could be. And then my friend David in Nanaimo, he was the first guy that I met. He happened to be my boss, but like I said, right. he, he that was a super pivotal. So I mean, like it, I knew it at the time. We, we both knew that there was something that we we're really connected in a way that we can't, neither of us can explain. And, um, and then the world that he, the doors that he opened for me to see. I mean, I can remember the first time seeing a piece of abstract art in his house and, and he's telling me how much he paid for it. And I can remember just thinking, well, that just sounds crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> Because I didn't have, I had no appreciation for it. I didn't know, I didn't yeah. understand it. Yeah. And so he taught me a lot about appreciation for the art in a way that I hadn't before. Yeah. You know, I always loved music and I had, was a full range of music that I loved. Yeah. But um, as far as the other, yeah, it was not, it was nothing. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I was ever even in an art gallery. So I was literally in, my art was in an art gallery. <laughs> I didn't no go thing. into art galleries. Yeah. That was not a place for me. I didn't feel welcome there. Yeah. But that was, that was my own stuff, right? I, yeah. I'm sure I would have been welcome. But I had these judgments about myself, like, you're not sophisticated enough. You can't be going into an art gallery. Who do you think you are? And then I'm selling my art in these galleries. I'm like, oh, like, I can't believe I'm coming in here <laughs> delivering this stuff. <laughs> are they going to want it? Really? And, the, and then the second time, they want it again? Oh, and then they now they want it again? So it took a while to that, for that to really sink in that mm -hmm. this is real. Mm -hmm. This is actually happening, and it's not going to just disappear in a big poof. So back to your question. Yeah. So I'm one to try and track too because yeah. I'm a very tangential speaker. Oh, but yeah. um, the uh, the pivotal that was pivotal. Meeting him was pivotal. Yeah. Um, I met an another person at that same job who was leaving her job. She was the bookkeeper there in the pharmacy, uh, and she had a property on Mudge Island. I can remember. When she said, oh, yeah, we have a property on Mudge Island. And I was so here, I was like, Mudge Island? That sounds awful, Mudge. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, that doesn't, who would want to go to Mudge Island? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. I didn't know how beautiful, I mean, I was so new here. It's like, every island is beautiful. It doesn't matter the name. Like, these are yeah. beautiful islands. Yeah. But I had never, I hadn't been anywhere yet. It was very new here. She was quitting her job there. She was the one who opened up the Calico Cat Tea House in Nanaimo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, to me, that was so risky. And they were building a house on mud. I'm like, are you allowed, are you, like, are you allowed to do that? I did, I just, yeah. it was, the concept was not, yeah. that you have to have a whole bunch of money and you have to hire someone who builds it. Like, you, you can't build your own house mm -hmm. and you can't, you can't just go start a tea room. Yeah. Yeah. Really? And then she did. And the Calico Cat was super successful. Yeah. She sold it a decade later. And it's like, so that sparked. That's a real 
Yeah. And then other friends who, like I met, yeah, just so many alternative yeah, right. people yeah. doing things that just would never have occurred to me. Yeah. So flash forward a few years, and Tammy and her then-partner decided to move to Mudge Island too, and built their own home, and slowly the artist that is Tammy started to emerge. And one year at Christmas, I gave my partner this little, tiny little set of acrylic paints. Because he was the artist in the house. Mm. Because that was another thing I always believed. Yeah. Only one artist in the house. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Yeah. And he was clearly it. And it wasn't even, it didn't even occur to me that I would be an artist. He painted one little picture and then never, he just wasn't interested. And then one day, several months later, I picked them up. And then that led down this path of folk art, like my folk art, my funny little folk art paintings that were really super amateur. But I was painting on wood. I was building these little, I was building these little stools and toolboxes mm -hmm. and things. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you one yeah. of them. So you get an idea. That was oh, one of the first yeah. stools yeah. that I built. And then I painted a rooster. And I was like, yeah. and I, I just loved that rooster so much. I just loved what I was doing. But I was also super judging. It's like, it's such a childlike thing. Like, who would, like, that's not art. But I loved it so much, I kept doing it. Here's Gabriel as Tina Jones with the song Twice from her 2016 album, Quickening. Was it about the 
kind of like that Canadian folk artist Maud Lewis, as shown in the movie a few years back called Maudie, Tammy's little toss-off folk art projects, well, people kept asking for them and buying and buying some more. Her love of stained glass that she was amazed by during that visit years ago to the glass shop with her grandmother, well, that bubbled to the surface. She took some classes, started making leaded stained glass, started a business making stained glass works, and then moved into kiln-fired, fused glass creations, freeing her from the restricting nature of making stained glass windows. What a creative explosion it was for her. Moving from sun catchers to bowls to constructing large sculptural works of fused glass, bursting with color and depth and meaning. Moving to Gabriola, and now with longtime partner Ode Howard, helping with iron frameworks for her designs. By the way, her old notion that she spoke about of only having one artist in the household, there could only be one artist in the household. Well, Ode is a creator, too, of many things. A multi-instrumentalist on the scale of Prince and the love of Tammy's life. You're listening to some of his playing around right now. So Tammy's glass art creations were a sensation. She was in galleries. Everything was selling as fast as she could make it. But there was a cost. When she felt that maybe glass art was becoming a different kind of a box, limiting her creativity, or as she describes it, like her own soul as two sisters competing for attention. It was a big blur of... um the lines were blurred between my art and me, and I, and it was in an unhealthy way. Like, I was taking my sense of confidence and worthiness from how well my art would do. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's going to lead you to, like, disaster, really, potentially, because it can't be tied up in that, right? right. My software yeah. can't be tied up in what I produce. Yeah. And, um, you know, so as long as I'm producing good things... Great, and when I produce something somebody doesn't like, and there's always there's always going to be stuff that people don't like, mm-hmm. and um, so then when I started painting, I I had this whole tug of war too. I loved it. Oh my god, I love these just raw paintings I was making, and I loved the process. I loved the end result, and I could see the look on people's faces. Like there were some people who were like, "Yeah, go for it." My art heroes, at least three or four of them were just, they bought some of my very first paintings, like, and they still, today, but the general public was just like, what the hell is she doing? (laughs) She's successful here. She's, don't throw away your success. This is, you you know, you keep doing what you're doing. She knows she's making a fool of herself or something. Like, I really, I heard people, there were, why would she do those paintings? Like, <laughs> I was like, I kept going because I can't, I can't not. Yeah, of course. You're this is her. what, you know, yeah. whether anyone else likes it or not, these are happening. This is happening. Yeah. I need it. I need it for my own growth, personal and creatively. And I mean, cause it's all together. Mm-hmm. It's all together. So the pieces inside of me was the big sister and then the gnarly little sister who was just like, fuck you, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be messy and dirty. And <laughs> and that was my paintings. Yeah. Coming in and just like, so what, you glitter? And then there was a the whole time of like, people didn't even notice that I had paintings hanging on the wall for probably the first four years. They either were noticed them and were completely not interested or they just didn't even see them. They saw only the glass. And so, and so, and I took that personally because it was such a tender place for that. Mm. That Those creative impulses were coming from such a tender place. That's the little sister getting her feelings hurt. And I just wanted, yeah, she just wanted to be loved. And um, the fucking big sister of the glass. You know? <laughs> and then, but so that took me a while. And, um... And then I, uh, you know, I realized, wow, like I, I want to love and honor 
all the things that my glass has brought me and really love and honor my glass and not take that for granted that this this piece that I'm letting these pieces fight and so I did like tons of my own <laughs> personal growth work sure and came through that now like everybody lives together <laughs> we're integrated <laughs> yeah. in my studio and inside of me her creative journey lessons learned and making a living as an artist led her to thinking it was high time to put it all down to record it and to be at that part of her life that she felt she could share her thoughts and insights with others in 2020 tammy released her first book entitled tender brave spirit an expressive life almost missed it's her story and her art carefully blended together in a style reminiscent of another West Coast Islander, Nick Bantock from Salt Spring, and his Griffin and Sabine series of books that came out in the 90s. This one had to come first. This story had to be told. Um, and I have fi- I had finally the confidence in my own voice and in my own ideas and concepts and beliefs Because I always used to think that you had to know it all before you could write a book. And then, and for me, like, my thoughts and ideas and beliefs are, are, they're they're a fluid thing. Like, Mm -hmm. they're not stuck in a place. So I had this fear of really stating what I believed to then be like five years ago. Oh, yeah, I don't really believe that anymore. (laughs) But then, but that's okay. Now I can see, no, that's okay. That's what I believe then. And, yeah, and we're all too hard on ourselves that way. Yeah, because, you know, in, in in just in all kinds of communication that that everyone, of course, you're going to evolve and your thoughts yeah. are going to change if you're open to it, right? Some people yeah. are closed off to everything. Yeah, but but that's another part of the message in this book is stay open to the to the world and the possibilities and yeah, right? and the thing is like. Even if, which which I will evolve, and some of these things I'm sure I will look back on in five years and go, yeah, I would tweak that a bit. I mean, I already had, I already have a couple of things where I'd be like, yeah, I would tweak that if I was going to do this again, but I'm not going to go into here. This is, this is a done thing. I'm not going to keep going back in and every time I do a print that I'm going to fix something. <laughs> so this is it. Yeah, I have to allow space for myself to evolve and then also know that where this book is, it's going to land for different people at different times too. So where maybe I some of my beliefs evolve differently beyond this. However, this book in five years could still land on someone else in exactly the right place for them to take in. And, and that's what it's like for me when I read other people's books. It's like... I can take it in at the level that I'm at of understanding these concepts Mm -hmm. or my own personal beliefs. And then I could read the same book a few years later. Oh, then there's that. Oh, that's cool. Right. Yeah. I understand this layer, but I didn't, it, it, it just went right past me before. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I know exactly. And, And by extension, I think of, you know, and it's the same with with your art and the art that you produce. I mean, it, it's going to land in people that are out of point or at, 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 that need to receive it, which is like all art, right? It will either speak to you or it won't. Yeah. Now I can love it all. Yeah. Which is why I can um, make the art journals the way that I do, and and now I'm teaching it. Like I never saw myself as that either, but the book led to that because I started to see myself differently and like you were referring to of the age that I am now like I was I've been such the student and I still am yeah everyone and I look learning, up right? and out to other people and I just really let myself take it in that there are people doing that with me too and it's time now for me to stand here on my own two feet and be someone who can offer something out. And I always just had this fear of 
not getting it right or someone won't agree with that and and now I just I love myself enough that it's okay of course everyone's not going to agree with my point of view about things or how I'm going to teach or the way that I'm going to and, and that's okay but it wasn't for a long time it was a scary place to go I've always loved reading the stories of writers and artists and their creative processes, how they get how they get it done, where does it come from? Hemingway had to write 500 words a day no matter what. Writer Maya Angelou preferred to work in a dirty old hotel room rather than her clean, well-cared-for home. Salvador Dali would start every morning with an affirmation about his genius and what a remarkable thing it was to be Dali and wondered aloud what amazing thing he would do that day. Steinbeck, Faulkner, and so many others were just self-destructive alcoholics. So I asked Tammy about her routines and habits for being creative. I have a habit of studio, like studio is my habit. Yes. I love being in my studio, I love coming to my studio, I love walking across the yard to get to my studio. I, I don't have like clear, you know, start at this time and at this um, I suppose, like, if you ask the ravens that live with us, because I heard somewhere <laughs> that the birds know more about our habits than we know about theirs, they could say, yeah, she usually wanders over the studio around, you know, she might be there really early in the morning, middle of the night, we do see that, and she probably gets over there about maybe around 11. <laughs> And then I take care of some businessy things. Hmm. You know, really the best creative time for me, either late afternoon and then into the e early evening, that's always been a pretty creative time. That's when I can really, I can settle into something and, and stick with it. And sometimes I'll sit, settle in something there and I'll stay with it right until like the wee hours if I'm really, really in it. Or if I have a major project that I'm working on and the flow's there. I would love to be the kind of person that has that, yeah, I'm in the studio. Like a friend of mine, five in the morning, every morning he's in a studio. It's four hours in there before his whole house kind of wakes up. And and that's what that's his thing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I want to do that. But it's just like... I, I, That's it's not, not thing. no, it's not. So right. it's a little bit more random. But once I settle in, mm -hmm. or I remove the distractions that will keep me from settling in, then I can really be in. Tammy says she creates every day in some way. She meditates most mornings, even for 10 minutes, and her time in the studio always begins with her rituals of sweeping the floor, clearing space to create, lighting incense, and pouring tea. Lots of green tea. And with a daily walk barefoot on the earth, no matter the weather, taking inspiration from her surroundings, the sights and sounds of life, places visited, books, music, and all forms of artistic expression. And nature is always prominent. I'm inspired by a, a lot of... I'm inspired by the natural world. It's not always direct, though. Like, it doesn't always seem like... It doesn't always come out as a direct translation. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it's the feeling of being outside, feeling the wind, the energy of the waves hitting the shore, or when I'm in Alberta, like looking out over the vast Massive expanse sky the and the sky. And um, so I think feelings are quite a lot involved. Um, how do I... There's a lot of technique involved in mixed media too, even though it of doesn't course. look like it. Mm. But with the glass, there's... There's even more in a way, like glass was the perfect place for me to start to fuse glass for me mm -hmm. was the perfect place and stained glass because it's, it's got some structure 
And I needed circuit. I couldn't have handled all the freedom that mixed media would have given me right at the very beginning necessarily. Um, without maybe with the right guide, I could have. That would be me now. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. why I can teach what I'm teaching because I know the pain of not feeling creative and not feeling like there's no room in the world for me to express myself in this way because I'm not good. I can't do it good enough. I know the pain of that so well. So that's why I, I believe that's why I can, I can translate. I can, yeah. it can come direct through me. I get that. Yeah. And I can, you can help. empathize. I can, sh I can empathize and I can, I can show you some things. Mm -hmm. um, so with glass, it was more precise, so even though it felt overwhelming at the beginning, even with learning stained glass, I'm a super determined person. I didn't know that then, but like I learned along the way, wow, I'm really determined. And I just kept going and going until I got good at cutting glass, till I could solder all those things. I wanted it so bad. Right. I just wanted it so bad mm -hmm. that I would put in the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the true now, too. Like, I just, the desire, I have a strong desire for my, when I got my projects, it's, it's, it's a powerful energy. Sure. And so that's fed by, you're, are you, are you taking notes or doing little sketches in a journal? No. Well, I mean, or, no, at the beginning, it, no, I didn't keep a journal for the first 10 years of when I was creating professionally right. at all. Yeah. I never drew any of my glass designs. I just started cutting glass and yeah. putting things together. With stained glass, you often will use a pattern. And so I would use patterns that other people had made. So you make right. a stained glass window or something. Yeah. And then I was invited by the man, my good friend, yeah. who has been such an inspiration, to create a stained glass window for his house. And he didn't want me to... I said, well, let's look at these pattern books. Pick one you like. He said, no, no, I want you to design it. And I'm like, what? I don't know how to do that. So again, that's part of that, why he was such an inspiration. David, right. He really challenged me to, yeah. to, to do that. And so the process, yeah, yeah. so I didn't yeah. use a journal for the first 10 years at all. Of, like I never drew, like I didn't draw. I'm not mm -hmm. an artist. Mm -hmm. I still, like that's what I felt. Mm -hmm. I'm making these things, but only an artist uses a sketchbook or a journal, like, you know, or a writer. Like <laughs> there's no place in for me there. Yeah. Crazy, hey? Yeah. So it wasn't until I, I think the first year that we traveled in India that I, I picked up a beautiful little book there because I, like, I loved the cover. It was a fabric cover. And, mm -hmm. and I just started putting little clippings and things in it. The way I've seen, I've seen these things exist. Yeah. Yeah. Those kind of journals that have everything stuffed in them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Used to be I worked all the time. That was a little bit when I was kind of still in that phase of like proving and being very, my worth is connected to what I produce phase, which lasted a fair while, mm -hmm. but that's not true anymore. So I know that my worth's not connected to what I produce and I, and I'm willing to have a gallery be waiting for me now rather than me just hustling all the time. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm not committed. Yes. And I mean, I still show up and I meet, meet what I commit to. I'm totally there. If you're curious, if a person is curious, that's all, that's all that you need mm -hmm. to start exploring creativity. Or if you're, if you're really accomplished in one area and you're afraid to try something different or or if, you're, if you've never tried any of it, like, what are you curious about? Mm -hmm. That's the place. That's the, that's the thread yeah. to follow. Because it isn't usually some big, oh my God, you're the most amazing drummer. I heard you drumming in the drum circle. Like, now you're like, now you're a drumming hero. No, it's often there's these little clues and we miss them because 
we, yeah, because we have the belief that it's going to be some big revelatory thing or that you have to work hard for many years to have something, but really, like, what are you curious about? Because curiosity will lead you to that. It will lead you somewhere and then be curious about where it leads you. I've posted links on the show's notes to Tammy Hudgens Art Studio, as well as the directory of all Gabriola artists from the Islands Arts Council. I want to thank Tammy for the tea and the time in her warm, light-filled studio on a cold, cold day. And to Tina Jones, see her web link as well on my notes, and Ode Howard. And thank you for listening. I'm going to be creating until... Uh, as long as I'm here on this planet, absolutely. And one time during this kind of journey in my mind, I don't know, maybe we were, there was a musical journey kind of thing, and I suppose there might have been like a pot brownie or something, I don't know, but I had a vision of me as an old woman, and like I don't have children, so I'm not gonna have the family thing where people gather around that. And I'm super introverted anyway. Like, not that that would stop family because I would want that, but yeah. I could just imagine being the old woman who's like still creating like super cool things and that younger people come to just be like, oh, there's that cool old lady who lives over there and she's making these really rad, Jet, like you should see, you want to come and talk to her for a while.